Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Devin. Um, we have an exciting day here for you today. We're going to be talking about website analytics. Um, I'm excited to talk about this with you all. I'm joined today with my good friend, Terry. Um, hey, everybody. So welcome, Terry. A um, few things before we get started. I just want to make sure that everyone can hear me. Uh, well, I guess first, this is me and Terry. I'm the field marketing manager here at Bluehost. Terry is the web concierge ma manager. Um, but a, a few housekeeping items first. First is audio. So I want to make sure that everyone can hear us. So if you can hear us, find the question box. It should be on the GoToWebinar dashboard and just drop an emoji. Let us know if you can hear us or uh, if you want to answer the question. If you could medal in an Olympic event, what event would it be? And it could be a real Olympic event, or it could be a made up Olympic event. Like I could get a gold medal in eating tacos. I like tacos that much. I could get a gold medal in that. Okay, awesome. People can hear me, we're cruising. Uh, as you have questions about today's webinar, the things that we're talking about, go ahead and drop them in the question box. Um, when I'm not presenting, I will be looking at those questions and I'll be doing my best to answer them. If we don't get to the question during the webinar, we'll have a question and answer section at the end of a Q&A section when we'll be covering those questions that we didn't have a chance to answer. Um, if you don't have your question answered then, don't worry, we'll still have your email with the questions that you asked and we'll be able to reach out afterwards. Um, audio diving gold medal, awesome. A gold medal in washing windows, we, sh we should talk. I, I, could, I, could use, I could use a gold medalist in uh, washing windows right now. Um, kayaking, napping, oh man, I, I, could, I could go for a gold medal in napping right now. Um, love all these responses, y'all. I hope you keep up this engagement as we go through. So today we're going to be talking about analytics and we're going to be covering a handful of different things and something else. Oh, a great question just came in. Will this recording be posted later? Yes, this recording will be posted. We'll be sending out an email to everyone that registered. So if you have to drop off early, um, then don't worry. We will be sending out a recording of this to everyone um after probably in the next 24 to 48 hours so as long as you registered for this you should be fine um and then we will also probably be uploading that to the bluehost youtube channel so it will be available there as well so what we'll be covering today analytics is a huge beast and we're going to do the best we can to give a high level overview and a couple tips along the way as uh, for a handful of different things that you can do to utilize those analytics to understand what's going on with your customers, with the people that are coming to your website, uh, and how to leverage those analytics to make improvements on your website and to make changes that can uh, improve your conversion rate or improve the traffic that you get to your website. Um, but j just to start as well, uh, if people are if you have a specific question about analytics that you'd like answered, go ahead and drop that in the question box. We'll try to make sure that we cover that. Uh, as I mentioned before, I am the field marketing manager with Bluehost and Terry is the web concierge manager with Bluehost. So we, I did see someone ask if we're Bluehost employees. We are both Bluehost employees. Um, mm -hmm. Terry is a, uh, a Jedi when it comes to building websites. So he, he will be our subject matter expert today. So let's just jump right into it. Why do analytics matter? Here's a long definition and it's very thorough of what exactly web analytics is. It's a collection reporting and analysis of data generated by users visiting and interacting with a website. So the definition goes on, but very simply put, it's gathering data to understand user behavior with a given website. And I like to kind of bring this home and why this is important with a, a little anecdote. Understanding the user experience. Let's say that you're having a party, you invite two different friends to your party. Uh, one of them shows up fashionably late, but shows up and you, has a great time with you. The other one never arrives. And a few days later, 
you reach out to them and say, hey, I was excited to spend some time with you. What happened? I, I don't know where you went. And uh, you find out that the friend that made it to your party decided to use Google Maps to get to your destination. And so they got live traffic updates. They got turn by turn analysis. They knew exactly where they were the whole time and they knew exactly how to get to where they wanted to go. Your other friend that never showed, it turns out they printed MapQuest directions. And I might be aging myself a little bit when I say that I remember the day when I had five or six pages of map, maybe not five or six pages, but you know, you had a, a couple pages of directions uh, and you would have to follow those and look at the map and hope that there weren't any road closures. Because if there was a detour or a road closure, there was nothing that the printout, the printed paper could do for you at that moment. And I like to think that sometimes our internet traffic is really similar to these two friends of ours. One of them has a great idea of exactly where they're going and they have the tools necessary that gets them right to the destination that we want them to get to. The other one gets confused, it gets turned around, it, it doesn't see the landmarks that it's looking for, there's a street sign that's knocked down for whatever reason, so they miss a turn, they don't get to where they're going, so they end up being frustrated, and you don't get to have the benefit of their presence uh, at your destination. So the same can be said for the user experience with your website. There are some people that are going to try to get to your website for whatever reason, and, and some of them will find exactly what they're looking for on your website, and they'll be happy. And maybe the, the destination that you're trying to get them to is a purchase page. Maybe it's just a blog article that you want to share. And there's going to be other people that end up there erroneously. There, there are people that weren't necessarily looking for it and, and didn't get to the destination they were looking for. And so um, you, you're unable to capture them as a new customer or as someone that's going to support your brand in the future. So what information can we learn when we use analytics? I like to think that there's three, actually probably closer to four questions that we can answer when we look at the analytics for our websites. Uh, number one, the, the first question we can answer is, how does traffic get to my website? Where is it coming from? What kind of traffic is it? Who's sending it my way? The second question we can answer is, what do people do once they arrive at my website? So when they get there, do they click around? Do they you know, if they're clicking around too much, it might indicate that they don't have good navigation, they can't find what they're looking for, or maybe it just means that they're browsing through multiple products before finding the right one that fits their needs. Um, sometimes people leave immediately, which contributes to something called a bounce rate that I believe Terry will go into depth in later. Um, but uh, sometimes people don't find what they're looking for. Maybe they, maybe your site ranked on a Google search result that you didn't intend to, and so people come and, and they, they leave because they realize they're in the wrong place. But using Google Analytics and other tracking information, we can determine what people do when they arrive at your website. Also, we can answer the question, how do users go from visitor to customer? With Google Analytics, we can set up goals. Uh, there's also parts of the analytics that show you the breakdown of the traffic that goes and looks at products and adds a product to their cart and actually goes through with the purchase. And so you can look at those conversions and those different, that, that buyer journey and that funnel to understand how exactly users go from visitor to customer. You can also get ideas um, with assisted pages to see what pages people are going to before they make a purchase. Maybe you have uh, a blog post that talks a lot about um, how to swap out a catalytic converter on a car or something like that. And after they read that blog article, they go and they buy your, um, your hard book on catalytic converter mechanics. I, I don't know, I'm, I'm clearly not a mechanic, but I, I think you understand what I'm trying to say is that um, sometimes there's other pages that contribute to the success of your website that maybe go a little bit unheralded, but with the with Google Analytics and looking at this data, we can understand what those sites are that are contributing to the success of your website. So very briefly, how do analytics work? 
Most people aren't going to care a ton about this, but I think it's interesting. Basically, a JavaScript snippet is inserted into the website's code. I, I believe it's inserted onto the header of a website, which puts it onto every website on the page, or sometimes it's injected directly into each page um, on the website. But essentially, when a user goes to access um, one of the sites, it will trigger that snippet and it will act as a tag. And when the browser requests that page to be loaded from the server, that JavaScript snippet records some of the information from their from the requester. Sometimes it will get their IP address, their geolocation. Um, if you've put some of your information on your Google and you're using Chrome, then it might get your age or your gender or more specific location on where you're um, pinging the website from. But basically, you need to connect um, Google Analytics or whatever analytic program you decide to use to your website to make sure that that JavaScript snippet is there so that when users are accessing your website, that code is triggered and it collates that data and then puts it into the software for you to use and to manipulate and to decode later. So the next question, which analytic tool should I use? There's a couple of them out there and I'm actually going to let Terry take over from here and walk us through this chapter and a few of the next ones. And I will try to answer as many of these questions as I possibly can. Okay, and thank you, Devin. I greatly appreciate the, um, the, the warm introduction. Uh, so which analytic tools should I use? Okay, so there are quite a few of them out there. Um, many work better with some programs than they do with others. However, um, the gold standard and among those that are the most popular would be Google Analytics. So um, Google Analytics is definitely the most popular um, in the free version of it. And there's different levels of it, but in the free version of it, it gives you a ton of analytics. Uh, some may consider it almost to be a little bit scary how much um, information they do actually give you uh, based on just people going to your website, how much time they spend and things like that. Um, also, with Google Analytics, if you have a WordPress site especially, um, it's very easy to connect to your site. So um, now, if you did not want to use it, some people say, hey, Google, they're too big, too many, uh, you know, they're involved in too much and they're intertwined in too many things and uh, they're, you know, they're the boogeyman. Uh, there are some other analytical tools out there that that also do some effective work but uh but google would be the number one in this area how would you set up your analytics and when setting those up there are a few things that you can do right so the very first way is you can set up those analytics uh with a txt file if you do it the traditional way, and some would consider it maybe an antiquated or old school kind of way, um, if you go to analytics.google.com and you start your account, it will want to make sure that you have control over the domain because it's not going to give you like so. For example, if that if it didn't do that, then anyone could just go to apple.com or uh, whitehouse.gov or wherever and say, hey, I want analytics for this site. So uh, what this does, it makes sure that you actually have control or ownership of the domain. And it does that via what we call a TXT record. Uh, so that is something that would be inside your domain in your DNS zone file or zone record. Um, you will be able to find that at your host, uh, whatever domain provider or, or domain registrar you will be working with, you can go to that registrar or wherever your name servers are set, you can go there and you can make that change or you can have the host assist you in where to make that change. So they give you an actual TXT record and you would add that in there like you would an IP address or a name server 
or a C name or any other type of DNS record. Um, if I'm nerding out a little bit, uh, you know, I'll scale it back a little bit. If you have questions about some of these things, uh, we could answer those a bit later. Uh, but uh, once you do that, what Google will do is they will want to confirm that on their end. So once Google senses that you have that record added in there in the DNS and it updates, they will then take you to the next level and they will begin to start to report your analytics. So it's usually about a three-step process. Um, also, you can put a code snippet in your in your um on your server and there are some other ways that you want to connect with it like that okay but there's also an easier way that we'll see on the next slide now uh google site kit is a plugin for wordpress sites especially if you have a wordpress website um google site kit is a plugin made by google that actually gives you a much easier path to add uh, these same things to your site. So it basically does the same process and it makes it so much easier. So what you would do is you would go and in the plugins, you would search for this plugin. Uh, so on the side, you would go down to uh, the plugin section in your WordPress dashboard. You would go to add a new plugin. When you add the new plugin, you just want to type in site kit in the right hand corner, in the top right hand corner. Of, uh, of that section in the, in the plugin section. When you get SiteKit, you want to um, install and then activate it. Uh, what it will do from there is it will, it will then ask you for your email and your login for that particular account. Now, let me go back just a little bit. I believe I skipped over one thing. In order to get these analytics, uh, one of the first things that you would have to do, you would have to start an account with uh, analytics.google.com. So uh, you wouldn't just be able to use just a random email address or anything like that uh, if you wouldn't if you hadn't set it up yet. So um, you can go to analytics.google.com, and then you would want to set up your account. And then you would want to add in as a property. They call it a property. You would want to add in as a property the domain that you would like them to monitor and so on and so forth. So once you set that up, then you'll be able to connect easy once you get this plug in. That is a very good way to um, connect it. And it's so much easier. So um, I personally prefer it that way. I personally prefer it that way. You'll have a much easier time. It's a lot user friendly and time, as we all know, is uh, the most extremely valuable commodity. So we want to save that time and get in there. Uh, there's another way also uh, when we set these up, if you do use Jetpack, right? If you use Jetpack, it also is powered by Google Analytics. So when you set up the Jetpack plugin that is available on any WordPress site, that's another good way. You can look at uh, some of these same statistics and everything that, that it gives you. Okay, uh, and we can move on. Okay, so how do users get to my website? Well, one good thing about analytics, and let's just do a quick tour of it. Uh, one good thing about analytics, it gives you a lot of detail and it gives you a lot of information so you can make informed decisions about how you want your site to behave, where you want it to go, uh, what are some things you can improve and what are some things you can change and so on and so forth. It shows you areas of opportunity, uh, where you're succeeding, what things you may have to improve. But one of the main things is um, in Google Analytics, it gives you a very detailed overview, but it lets you know specifically, how do people get to my website? Well, there's a lot of different ways. So if you notice in our slide, um, it shows some of the top channels. What are some of the, like the, the most obvious and simple ways that people come to your website and what are the percentages of those? And it shows you here on this graph. So in this particular instance, this um, 
website user, um, people directly access it. So this person gets a lot of traffic just organically. Uh, they also have some paid search. So 9.4, almost 10% of their website traffic comes from paid searches. So um, that's where that could be anything from Google ads, social media ads, and so on and so forth. Okay, so then you have another section um, that is called display. So that could be anything from ads on different blogs, on different other websites, things like that, where it's just display, like there's banners and markets, things like that. Okay, then you have affiliates. Okay, affiliate, um, there's a lot of companies that do affiliate marketing. They place ads on different, very popular websites and, and as much as blogs and other things like that. So uh, you could generate traffic that way. Um, some is referral traffic, some of it's organic search. So it gives you a very, very detailed view over all of the things in here and, and all the ways that people actually come to your site. And then it lets you know over here, like who your users are and where are your peaks, where are your valleys, uh, where are you maintaining? Where are you doing well? Are you dropping off? Are you picking up? Are certain things more popular than others? Um, even if you do e-commerce like some of us do, uh, starting with um, when the pandemic came, a lot of people saw areas of opportunity doing a lot of e-commerce. So you see a lot more of that now. Um, but this lets you know um, if you're rising or if you're falling, or if you're uh, if you need to improve something, so you know, hey, you know what? Um, like if you sell um, if you sell flowers, and you know that Valentine's Day is coming up, you may want to do a sale then. Um, you know, maybe people buy more flowers on the 15th than they do on the 14th, and so on and so forth. That next week may be a little dry for you but also um, it showed you other things. So for example, if you tell, if, if you sell t-shirts, um, you may have peaks and valleys and it shows you those things. So you know, hey, this is maybe when I should run a sale or most of my people are coming during these times and these hours. So I should run a, so based on my target market, I should run some sales around this time and, and so on and so forth. So this gives you a very good detailed view of some analytics and some things that you can use to uh, leverage that information. Okay, what you got for me next, Devin? Okay, so what do people do once they arrive at my website, right? That's a, a very good question. Ideally, uh, we would want people to spend the maximum amount of time on, on your website. Uh, you do want to consider that a conversion. You would like to convert people. Um, if you are a, a an, an e-commerce website owner, um, a conversion, you may want that. That may look like a sale to you. Um, if you uh, just have an informational website or you want to set appointments or you want to book people or you want people to book your service or um, or your or you want if you're a barber or a pet groomer and you want uh, to get some leads and have some people uh, set up appointments with you and things like that uh, those are what we consider conversions maybe you only want to uh, just collect some emails and some information and send a newsletter out to people and just have them inter interact with your website. Like if you're a blog owner or you have an informational or educational type website or a message that, that you would like to get out. So you would say, hey, can I send you more information? Uh, what's a good email where you could know about events that may go on in your city? Things like that. Um, we all want those things, but right here it gives us some key performance indicators and some things like that in terms of what are people's uh, main things that they do when they come to your site how many pages are they viewing how long are they staying on those particular pages um, on average uh, they they let you know that you have about seven seconds to convert a person 
when they're on your page. So you have to structure it in a way where you can engage their intention and have their, you know, have that click through rate uh, do that. Uh, so for example, in this example right here, we see that this individual had uh, 355, almost uh, 356,000 page views. Now, out of those page views, it lets us know that uh, about 224,687 of those were unique. So those were first time people who were coming. First time people that ever went to your site, right? Average time spent on a page, 52 seconds. Depending on uh, how much content you have and what you're trying to do, that could be good or bad. I would say uh, if someone spends 52 seconds, almost a minute on a, on a particular page, that could be very, very good, okay? Um, maybe not so much depending on what type of site you have and what uh, a conversion would look like to you, okay? Bounce rate is at about 48%, so that's about 50%. So 50% of the people who visit this site almost leave within, after 52 seconds, they spend a minute and then and then they're out of there. So, so then, then you have your exit. So this is why um, these things are important because it lets you know. So for example, uh, let's say that you are a blogger and um, you can see a dip when you talk about a certain, a certain type of information. Uh, let, let's say you're, let, let's say you have a food blog, but maybe you talked about a restaurant that you said, hey, you know, we saw a rat running across the floor or something. It was terrible. Hey, you, you might have dropped that day. People might have been grossed out, something like that. But it, it gives you really good indicators of what people are doing once they arrive to your website where they're staying. And then it has it where you could break it down hourly, daily, weekly, and even monthly. So you can get those um, analytics, but all these things help you. They give you the information that you need in order to make improvements, to make adjustments, uh, to add new content, new features, new things so that you could take your website and possibly your business to the next level. Okay. so. Um, how do users go from visitor to customer? Well, um, if you've ever seen the movie Field of Dreams, anybody saw that movie before I saw it when I was young? Uh, one of my favorite lines on there that says, if you build it, they will come. So uh, how do people go from visitor basically to customer? Uh, with your analytics here, this gives you a very, very good indicator of people's behaviors while they're on while they're on your site. Are people adding things to their cart? Are people interacting with the products or services that you have available? So uh, what they do is things that are well set up, things that are um, exciting to buy, like things that are new, like if you have some things and you're selling some things, it, it lets you know uh, what the interest level of the audience is in certain items that you have. Um, it lets you know um, basically like how many like sessions people look at certain products. Uh, let's go back to the t-shirt example. Um, let's say you have a t-shirt that has a real cool slogan or a really nice cool graphic or something on it. Um, you may think it's cool, but the audience at large may not think so. They may not share your enthusiasm about that particular piece, but there may be a piece that you said, hey, why do people just like this? I didn't think this was really cool. It's only a, uh, it looks like a, it looks like a NFT thing that was made on, that was made on a WP paint or something like that, or, uh, or something like that. But, but you can get a lot of interest in that and, and it shows, and then it lets you know, uh, Hey, you know what? So many people, they added some things to their cart, but then they abandoned their cart. They just didn't buy it. Maybe they'll want to come back for later. Um, maybe not. Maybe they just got interested. Maybe they got uh, called away. They might have got an emergency call. Um, if you're anything like me, I'll be in the middle of wanting to buy something from Amazon. And then uh, my wife will come and say something and, and give me a honeydew list. 
and things like that. So I had to step away for a minute. It could be anything, but these give you some indicators as to uh, what happens. And when people go to your site, this is, you know, this is what happens. So uh, these are, this is really wonderful information given here by Google and it's very detailed. Okay, all right. Okay, Devin. Okay, so um, leveraging analytics for site improvement. Information is key, knowledge is power. So uh, so first things first, um, so, so we have some things here. So um, your marketing efforts should speak to your intended audience. Use these numbers to make sure your message resonates with the intended audience. Um, I know a lot of us, uh, depending on what you uh, have a website about, we say, well, hey, I want everyone to come. I want people of all kinds, but um, we have to learn how to get more granular in terms of who is your target market? Who is your target customer? That demographic, what does that look like for you? Um, who can you envision? Um, so for example, if if you sell women's shoes, okay, women of all ages are going to wear shoes, um, but do you have, do you wanna target an older generation, that middle generation, a younger generation? Uh, what are the pros and cons of each? Who spends more money? Uh, that kind of thing. What do you have? The most passion for who do you the most identify with and many times you have to look at uh, some research you have to do some research on your market uh, you want to research your competition who is your competition selling to where are they the most successful what do they sell the most of uh, you have to really understand your your demographic. Um, if anybody remembers David Hasselhoff, uh, he made a country album some eons ago, like back in the 80s. And he said on an interview one time that he sold nine copies of that particular uh, album or in that day tape that he made. And he sold nine copies, but then he looked up and some years later, over in the Ukraine, he was extremely popular. He was like the biggest star over there. And he set and broke records of numbers of concerts of people uh, over there coming out to see him because he understood later on who his audience was. Uh, there's a documentary about a gentleman um, and his name was uh, Sixtro Rodriguez. You could look him up. Um, he was a rocker and a singer from Detroit, Michigan, had a sound similar to like a Bob Dylan, uh, that kind of sound in that day. Um, and he didn't have a good run over here in the US, but found out that his music was very instrumental in the uh, liberation effects over in South Africa. And he was a major, major star over there and didn't know it. So uh, understanding what your demographic is, and now that we're in a global economy and things are moving globally for us, um, you can may maybe you're maybe you don't have the biggest uh, um, audience in Iowa, but you may have the a huge audience in Brazil. You you never know. So uh, now that we have global exposure and we can do things via the internet, via our websites and things like that, this tool really helps us. Okay, so. Uh, look past the first number, um, like low time on site, high bounce rate, things like that. That could indicate that the audience is uninterested. And this is valuable information. Feedback is your friend. So um, if people aren't interested, um, you can either take that content and remove it. You can change it, things like that. Uh, because this is good information. Um, if you're selling something on your site and people just are not buying it, for example, you may live, I live in Phoenix, Arizona. If I wanna set up a store that, um, that sells, um, I don't know, uh, Statues of Liberty and saying, I love New York, I'm probably not gonna get a lot of sales in that particular area. That's something I need to move on from. Okay, so it, it lets you know, it may show that 
you have an uninterested audience in that particular product or service. Okay. Um, also, another thing, geography. Validate your efforts if your if your business is local. Uh, target your effort if your business is widespread. Uh, interact with the people that want to interact with you. Uh, very good insight there. So um, you want to. Um, if you have a brick and mortar store, you definitely want to have a lot of local traffic coming there. Um, I know some gentlemen right here in my city in Phoenix, Arizona, who own a hat store. Strangely enough, where they do a lot of their marketing and they get a lot of on online orders because their store is not very far from the airport. And when people are in the airport, they see their advertisements and they go to their store and order. So they say, hey, this is a huge opportunity. Let's make sure we can structure something and work this out and we can leverage this information. And it's again about understanding your demographic, understanding who your audience is and using that information to position yourself to get the best results, okay? And um, detecting abnormalities, a spike in traffic from an unfamiliar region might be an attempted hack. Very true. So uh, you do want to watch for that. Um, and as a sidebar, if you don't have security and things on your website, you do want to make sure that you get with an expert and set up some security measures on your site. Uh, you don't want your site to get hacked or anything like that. But one good indicator on that is a, a spike from a place that you've never heard of or you've never seen and it hasn't come up before. Um, it could be bots, it could be uh, individuals trying to hack your site and and uh, you do not want that problem. So um, let's, let's make sure that, that you take those things. But, uh, but understanding your demographic and your audience is key. You have to know who you are selling to. Um, there are a lot of people who get very niche with who they're selling to. Um, certain things are for certain people. Um, so you, you want to make sure that you have that. Even if you're not only doing e-commerce, if you have a blog, um, maybe your blog is for a certain segment. Maybe it's for people who are tech people. Maybe it's for a group of people who are travelers or and so on and so forth. Maybe uh, you want to write a blog about hiking different places and going things, doing things outdoor. You could have a fitness blog or a, a cooking blog, things like that. Um, make sure you know who that audience is. How are you marketing to that audience? How are you marketing? How are you getting your word out and your, and your uh, message out to that audience? Okay, and one more thing, and I think this is somewhat of an underrated topic, but uh, with your audience, with your audience, understanding the technology that goes behind things, uh, compatibility with most uh, used browsers devices should be prioritized, which is cool. Um, we all know that uh, Google Chrome is the most popular browser in the world. However, every but one does not use it. Uh, some people have older devices um, that may not use Google Chrome. Uh, there are some people who don't trust Google, so they use other browsers. Uh, anyone who has an Apple device, a lot of people with Apple devices use Safari. Um, I've, I've worked with individuals here who um, they couldn't see certain things on Safari, but they were able to see it on Chrome. And I had to advise them, hey, this is something that you want to look into because someone can see this on Chrome and they can see this feature or what you're doing on your website here, but it does not show up in the same way over here in Safari. Uh, you want to make sure it's uh, it's optimized. Um, a lot of the traffic, if you notice years, uh, maybe a few years ago now, Google has switched over to a mobile first priority. So um, you have a larger market of people who use their mobile devices to access websites, so you want to make sure that's together, whether that's Chrome, whether that's Safari, uh, there's Edge, uh, there's a lot of different browsers out there that you want to make sure are optimized for that. Um, uh, identify high bounce rates for potential issues. 
if people are just leaving your site and you're getting a mass exodus uh, of your site, you definitely want to look at that. Um, maybe it's not only content, but um, you could have broken images. Uh, there could be things on there that aren't necessarily correct or they can't see or they can't access. Uh, maybe you have something that's taking too long to load, things like that. Uh, please make sure that when you're looking at those things and you're considering that, um, that you that you go through. Uh, one good thing uh, that I always advise is to make sure you do some testing on multiple browsers. Have some individuals with different browsers who you know, hey, you know what, can you go to my website, take a look, make sure you're able to see all of these things. That way you can make sure that your audience is getting the optimal experience. Okay, and uh, Devin, I think I've just maybe talked the audience's head off. Uh, so uh, I'll turn it back to you and prefer the platform to you. All right, thank you, Terry. Um, I I always appreciate your insights. So I don't think you're talking anyone's head off. I, I could <laughs> sit here and listen to you all day, but uh, I appreciate that. Um, Much appreciated, so, my friend. Uh, We'll we'll hear from Terry uh, once we get to the Q and A portion of this as well. But um, I want to talk a little bit about understanding UTM parameters. And maybe people have seen UTM parameters before. Um, it's I forget what it stands for. It's like Urchin Timed Metrics or something like that. But Urchin was the company that Google acquired that brought this technology to their platform. What it stands for isn't that important. What it is can be significantly important to anyone that's running marketing campaigns for their website. Basically, a UTM is a tracking code that the users can create to build a link that um, tracks how someone arrives at your website. So UTM links allow users to more accurately pinpoint the exact link that brought them to their website. A lot of the Google Analytics that we've talked about and the things that we've looked at have talked about what people are doing when they're on your website. Some of them talk loosely about how someone arrived to your website from social, but once your business is large enough, then people start running multiple marketing campaigns at the same time. You might have three or four different ads running on Twitter and some of those might be supported by similar campaigns on Facebook, on YouTube, things like that. So you can create these UTM links that will help monitor those campaigns and help you determine um, which, which of those ads or ad sets or campaigns was the most effective and the biggest bang for your buck. So when you're creating a UTM, basically you take the landing page that you want someone to arrive at, and then you put some of this tracking information at the end of it, and then you build out a link and you can use that link in your ads or when someone clicks on an ad or, or something that they come across that refers them back to your website. If they click on that specific link, then it will count every time someone arrives at your website using that link and then you can go into your Google Analytics and look at that data you can manipulate that data to understand which of these campaigns or which of these platforms is the most effective for you so this is this is the definition that Google gives for um, what they what each of the UTM parameters are uh, these are the three that I really like to focus on source medium and name source is effectively where is the traffic coming from specifically for example twitter or facebook or pinterest or um, maybe a newsletter or something like that the campaign medium that's more what channel it's arriving from so all of those are a lot of those channels like twitter and pinterest or even TikTok, those could all be lumped into social. And um, the newsletter, that might be under an email medium. And then the campaign name is the specific campaign that you are advertising or that is appended to that link that is bringing people back to your website. It can be fairly confusing at first, but I think once people start using it and once you start applying it, uh, it becomes 
increasingly easier. And to make it easier, Google has actually created something that will generate the link for you. So all you have to do is go in and fill in the information and tell them where you want the user to land. So in this case, it's bluehost.com. Uh, this one in particular we're building is going to go on Twitter, which is part of our social channel. And it looks like this campaign is going to be uh, part of the Black Friday sale. And under campaign term, uh, I like to put what keywords that I'm trying to rank for there. So if I'm ever trying to see how my campaign is correlating with my search terms, I can easily see that information. So once you put that information in, Google will put together a fairly long link that you can then share out. And whenever anyone clicks that link, you will know specifically that that is how they arrive to your website. Now, there's a couple things that I want to point out here. Um, one is that you can put spaces in the campaign name. You can put spaces in these and uh, Google automatically adds in a plus for the spaces. So you don't have to worry about smash mashing all the words together in order to try to you know, make it web friendly, they take care of that for you. The other thing that I wanted to point out is that these UTM parameters are case sensitive. So as you go through and you start looking at these, um, it's, it's a good idea to make sure that you're very consistent when you're building these. So as you do your campaign throughout the year or throughout the years, it's it's very similar and you can see how Twitter performed over time and you can see how specifically the Black Friday sale performed on Twitter over time. So a couple best practices and benefits of using the UTM parameters. Uh, it, it allows for great AB tracking. And for those of you that are not familiar, AB is when you have two different data sets or ad sets, you know, maybe one of them has a really large picture of someone using your product and uh, it has some of the benefits of your product in small words across the bottom. And maybe a different ad set has a list of all the features and benefits that you get from using your product, but it has a smaller picture. You can put both of those two different ads out into the world. And after a while, more people are probably going to click on one over the other, depending on what the preference is of your target audience. And then you can take a look at these UTM details and you'll be able to see which of those ads perform better. And over time, hopefully you'll begin to develop the pattern um, and you'll be able to tell for your product and for your business, which ad set works best for, for your audience and converts better. It can also help track the efficacy of your marketing efforts. Uh, I know specifically on social media, sometimes people try to do organic marketing where they're not paying for ad positions or they're not paying for um, like a sponsored post or something like that. They're just trying to organically use social media to boost their brand, to boost their presence and to um, increase people's knowledge about what they're doing. And so you can use these UTM parameters and say, okay, this is, I'm going to track how, how many people click on this tweet that I'm going to put out. And I'm going to track how many people sign up for this newsletter that I'm going to put out. And then after time, you can go back and look and say, okay, uh, tons of people were interested in the newsletter, but no one particularly cared about my, my tweet. So perhaps Twitter is not where I should focus my money. Maybe I should invest in a better email platform, or if I'm going to hire an employee, I should hire someone that can handle my email marketing, not my social media, because it seems like my audience, <clears throat> excuse me, it seems like my audience is more interested in my email efforts. Best practices for UTM, and honestly, this is best practices for most web analytics endeavors. Uh, I think that you should, specifically with UTM, you should have a spreadsheet to track all of the UTM links that you build. It sounds tedious at first, but it's much easier to have one spreadsheet that you can refer back to and say, okay, this is my ad that I put on Twitter um, that has a large picture and small text. I, I know whenever I'm going to use that, I can just pull that link right there. And then next to that, you know, or somewhere else on that spreadsheet, you can have the link for your other ad set or for the other location that you're positioning the ad. 
And I think that that's very helpful so that you don't have to say, okay, let me go back and rebuild the link every single time I'm going to put this campaign out there. Another best practice is just consistency. As I mentioned before, UTM parameters are case sensitive. Uh, you can put spaces in them, but it's important to be consistent because if you if you accidentally mistype something, if there's a typo, if there's a capital letter in one UTM tracking link that there wasn't in the other, it will show up as a different data um, point on your Google Analytics. And you can log in to your Google Analytics, and I believe it's under um, acquisition campaigns, all campaigns, and then that's where you can see the tracking results from the UTM parameters that you've set up. So I know this is not a very deep, deep dive into analytics. That's the difficult part with analytics is there's so, so much that you can go into. You can, you know, you can look at different ways to boost your SEO using analytics. You can look at how to improve your bounce rate. There's a lot that can be covered. And if you all are interested in, in going into more detail, then maybe leave uh, something in the in the question box and, and we can look into doing this again and, and going into more depth on specific things. But for now, we have a few more minutes here at the end. Uh, Terry is back with us. So uh, we're gonna go through a couple questions that we have that popped up. Um, and I'll try to answer some, and I think Terry will try to answer some as well. By the way, I wanted to apologize. It looks like there was a glitch in the GoToWebinar software and it did not start the PowerPoint at the beginning when I was presenting. So I apologize for that. I will make sure that the PowerPoint in its entirety is available for download after this is done. And I will also try to include that in the recording of the webinar that goes out. I'll try to do some editing magic to make sure that that lines up. So let me go through the questions real quick and um, shoot out some questions. Uh, Terry, I'm gonna throw this one in your court. Other, okay. than Google, other than Google Analytics, are there other analytics that you would recommend? Um, there are, I'll say this, there are some that exist. Um, I don't know if I would go, uh, in terms of, of of recommending any, but I can I can get a list together, um, if, if if that's what you if that's what you like. Um, in my opinion, and just in my experience with what I've been doing, um, when it comes to the three things: cost effectiveness, ease of use, and um, and the user interface being able to work with it within your computer uh, with no connection errors and things like that uh, Google Analytics would be the would be the top one plus it interfaces with a lot of other types of programs uh, some of the other ones that are out there uh, they they do good on a lot of levels but they're not as robust as Google on that one so um, but I, I will get a list together um, to get you that information cool Awesome. Uh, we've got a few other questions here and, and sadly not a ton of time to get to them all, but if we don't get to your question, we will follow up with an email and make sure that your question is answered. Uh, one of the question is the following. Does, a, does having a professional theme or layout affect bounce rate? Um, uh, that's an excellent question. You want to get, get that one, Devin, no, or you no, want to go? Please, please. I, okay. I'd love to hear what you yes, have uh, Yes. Uh, so, uh, so building building a website isn't just uh, slapping some pictures up in a little bit of text and some stuff. I mean, there's a science to it. You have to figure out uh, things like like the rule of three and things like where your eyes are naturally going to fall, what colors stick out the most, what fonts are the best based on your uh, audience, and things like that. Um, so there, there's a, there's definitely a science to it and a layout that's not good or that's not comfortable or convenient or palpable for your audience will definitely affect your bounce rate. It definitely will. So, uh, you do want to observe best practices and before you start actually building your website, make sure you do, uh, some research, uh, just real quick, cause I know we have to move on, but, uh, that's why even when you look at a 
a WordPress theme, a professional WordPress theme. Uh, you want to make sure that it's in best practices, that it's clean coded, uh, that it's rated well, that it has those really nice optimal type layout so you can feature your best content and things like that. Excellent question. Yeah, that is that is a great question. Um, let's see, I just had another one. I scrolled away from it. Dang it. Okay. Um, another bounce rate question. What is a good bounce rate? I, uh, I'll, if you have a, uh, an answer to that, Terry, that, that's fine. I'll, I'll give my shot at it and then you can correct me if, if I'm wildly <laughs> off the mark. Um, no. I think bounce rate is kind of tricky because mm -hmm. from what I understand, it's a measurement of how many people come to your website and then exit without going to any other site on your on, on your entire site. So it's possible that the one site that they go to is the only site that they needed. Maybe it's the blog post that gets them the recipe that they were looking for and then they leave. Um, so it's, it's hard to say what a good bounce rate is. I've seen some numbers out there like 30 and 40% is a, is a decent bounce rate, but it's one of those things that I feel like people can always try to optimize to try to get a, a better bounce rate. Mm, um, I think you pretty much nailed it, Devin. Um, most of the time, um, people will say that anything under 58% is a good bounce rate. Um, but I agree with Devin that it's relative to the type of site you have. Um, certain types of websites people aren't going to spend as much time on, um, depending on what it is. So so that's, that's very relative. Um, if you have an information type website where you want to keep people for decent amounts of time, so for example, let's say you have a blog or you have something that's educational, informational, or you're giving resources and you want people to be there for a while and your base and your um, your bounce rate is like 60, 70 percent, that means that 60 percent, so more than half of the people who go to your website are leaving quickly. So you may want to do some restructuring, you may want to do some changing that lets you know, but basically um, to Devin's point, uh, 30, 40 percent is good, but you're doing OK if you're under 58 percent. Yeah, and that actually brings up a point that I wanted to mention earlier and, and slipped my mind. Uh, as far as best practices when it comes to reporting on analytics, I think it's always best to include context. You know, if I just Definitely. tell you that, um, hey, great news, we had 100,000 visitors on the website. That I mean, that sounds great and that's a wonderful number. But if you're the web, if if the website that you're reporting on is YouTube, then 100,000 is really, really, really low. And so, <laughs> right. you know, there might be something terribly wrong with 100,000. And also, over what time period, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, oftentimes people say it's a best practice to give more context to the data. So maybe you say we are at 100,000 views over the past week, which is up 15%. On the week over week data, so the, you know that that gives you a little bit more context. That shows some some growth. That shows some progression. It gives whoever's hearing that stat a little bit more of a picture of what they're what's going on. Um, uh, another question here is Google Analytics accessible through Bluehost or WordPress dashboard? Uh, I believe that if you set up the Google Site Kit, then as a, one of the mm -hmm. plugins on your WordPress dashboard, your analytics will be available there. Also, I believe Absolutely. that they will be available through um, Jetpack. However, Correct. I I believe that they are a truncated edition of what your full Google Analytics allows. If you go, if you just do a uh, Google search for Google Analytics and log in there, not to say that you need to do that every time. And like we've said consistently, this there's just so much information. It's easy to get lost in the weeds and to add segments and secondary sure. dimensions and, and third dimensions when you're looking at the data. So sometimes it's helpful to say, hey, this this plugin just gives me the information that I'm curious about, you know, and it it kind of streamlines what what means the most to me. Agree. Um, <clears throat> okay. Is is there anything else that 
uh, that you would like to say in closing, Terry? I'm, af I'm afraid we have to close out at this point. But oh, any, that's any, terrible. Any other, anything else that you want to talk about? Um, just real briefly, I would just want to wish everybody the best of luck. Um, if you do need help with your website, with setting up your analytics or anything like that, uh, you could always reach out to us at Blue Sky, uh, and and we'll be glad to we'll be glad to help you and assist you. Uh, but otherwise, I wish you the best. I hope this was of some benefit to you. And uh, any other questions that we have that we didn't get to, uh, we'll do our best to get that information out to you. Uh, via email or or any other uh, medium we have to connect. All right. It's been fun. Terry, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you all learned something, and we will talk to you all soon. Thanks have so much. Everyone. Bye.